Um, so our first speaker today um, is Dr. Amy Toth from uh, Iowa State University. Um, she's in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology and also Entomology at Iowa State. And she's doing really uh, amazing work on nutrition and nutri genomics in bees. And I'm looking forward to her talk. So um, Amy, are you ready? Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. This is my first day of Mondia, and I'm really excited to have nothing but bees for four days. Great stuff. So today I'm going to talk to you about nutritional health in honeybees. A lot of us are interested in this topic, and I'm actually going to give you a perspective from some of the work that we've been doing in Iowa, um, despite the fact that it, it is a changing world um, throughout, not just where I live, but all over the world. Um, anthropogenic change is transforming the landscape. And in many places in the world, um, we have what was once a diverse natural landscape being transformed into landscapes that are being used for human use, such as animal pastures, um, urbanization, and monoculture cropping systems. I'm gonna to focus today on uh, agricultural development and its influences on bee health and bee nutrition, in particular because these monoculture cropping systems really represent an extreme case of loss of biodiversity. Um, as we have gotten better at farming the world, we have also gotten better at eradicating um, other pests, even beneficial insects, and we've also gotten better at eradicating some of the weeds that um, have provided forage for bees. So my talk is going to focus on uh, some work that we've been doing in the state of Iowa. So in the U.S., 40% of land is currently under cultivation, and so the darker green here indicating, as you can clearly see, a band of extremely high cultivation in the center of the country. Here's where I live, Iowa. Um, it is about 86% of its land cover in cultivation, and sits, so this is really an extreme case of, of uh, landscape use for agriculture. This is what it looks like from the air. Uh, it looks very, very cultivated, as you can see, and it's sometimes called uh, flyover country because it's not a lot to do there for humans, and if you're a bee, um, I think you can see why they call it flyover country as well. And so it's, it's a very uh, highly intensively cultivated landscape, and it's intensively cultivated into two main crops, corn and soybeans, neither of which are um, pollinated by honeybees in this, in this area. Um, and neither of which provide um, a lot of forage for bees, and I'll get more into that in a moment. And so here we have a nearly totally transformed landscape in Iowa. And so historically, about 80% of the state of Iowa was in native tall grass prairie pre-colonization, and today we have less than 1.1% uh, of the land in prairie landscape with over 80% farmland, and the vast majority of this in monocultures of corn and soybean. And so is this kind of a model for what the rest of the world is going to look like as we continue to use the land and develop it for our own human needs? And so this makes Iowa actually a really interesting case to examine what's going on with bee health. So this has been a drastic change for bees as well. So if uh, you imagine once upon a time, um, this provided actually a very high floral diversity, which could provide a lot of forage, both for uh, wild bees as well as managed honeybees. And now the landscape looks a lot like this. There's very low floral diversity, uh, incredibly intensive um, cropping of corn and soybeans, and extremely efficient weed control so that there's very little um, very little forage available in the landscape overall. In our landscape, uh, we are highly dominated by two crops. We have soybeans. Um, these produ produ do produce nectar, which is utilized by honeybees. Um, however, it is only produced for a short period of time, about one month during the, the, the growing season. And also we have corn, which um, yes, is sometimes used as a pollen source for honeybees. Uh, but it is typically not thought to be of a very good nutritional value and is not favored by bees as a forage source. They're not commonly using corn um, for pollen forage. So we have this, again, extreme landscape, which is providing uh, very little forage for honeybees and for very limited periods of time during the bee season. 
We also see at the same time extremely high annual colony losses. So this is uh, some data from the wonderful Bee Informed Partnership uh, data. And this is a typical uh, map from, this just happens to be from 2017, 2018. But nearly every year uh, we see that the upper Midwestern United States, here is Iowa, um, and the darker colors indicate higher colony losses. Um, we see around 60% average colony losses in Iowa during this year. That's actually pretty normal for us. So we have a combination of these stressful landscapes and we also have harsh winters. And so overall annual colony losses are, are very, um, very high and certainly at a level that is considered unsustainable for beekeeping. And so why is this happening? Um, so clearly there are multiple stressors out there and many people in this conference will be talking about thinking about these things. Uh, we have a lot of pesticide usage and uh, that's something that I'm also interested in but I'm not going to talk too much about today. We also have um, obviously enemy number one, the varroa mite um, and its associated pathogens as well as other pathogens that present challenges to bees. But today I'm going to focus on the transformation of the landscape and poor foraging resources and the consequences that this can have for honeybee health. So focusing in here on poor foraging resources. And I really do think that uh, the bottom line is that nutrition is fundamental and if nutritional health of bees is suffering, then they're going to be less resilient to these other forms of stress as well. So nutrition, as we know from studies on humans and a wide variety of other organisms, is fundamental. You are what you eat, and that is also true for a bee. Without a baseline of um, good, high quality nutrition, as well as a wide diet breadth, uh, you can be lacking in micronutrients and um, basic uh, macronutrients, and this can lead to problems with immune health and problems with um, fighting off other stressors such as disease. Honeybee diet, we sort of think of as uh, deceivingly simple consists of just plants and, and nectar and pollen. So deceivingly simple, but in reality it is uh, subtly complex. And so bees are foraging for nectar um, from a wide variety of different plant sources. This provides them with carbohydrates, but also contains some important phytochemicals that help to um, stimulate detoxification systems in bees, as well as foraging for pollen, their main source of amino acids, uh, lipids and many of a wide variety of micronutrients. We also know that bees forage for a diverse diet uh, composed of the nectar and pollen of multiple species of plants and will seek out a, um, a variety of different food sources uh, when they are available to them. So today what I'd like to talk to you about is four basic research questions uh, related to this question of nutritional health in honeybees. First of all, can a good diet protect bees from other sources of stress? And when I say good diet, we're really thinking about a good, um, high quality and diverse diet. What is the connection between agricultural land development uh, and honeybee nutritional state? Is there a nutritional criti critical period across the season for bees that we can identify and therefore target for trying to um, improve the nutritional health of bees? And what are some possible real-world solutions that we can implement to um, increase bees' nutritional resilience to stress in the environment? And again, we're doing this in the context of what I think is an extreme land, Iowa, in which the land cover is extremely highly uh, ag agricultural, and so can possibly represent a good model for thinking about um, how improving bees' nutritional health in the context of um, uh, an anthropogenically changing landscape um, how that can play out globally. So first I'm going to turn to the first question, can a good diet protect bees from other sources of stress? And here um, we're really interested in, and you can see in the comb here, bees are collecting a wide variety of pollen sources when available. And so do these diverse diets uh, provide nutritional health benefits to bees? So we wanted to look at this in the context of interacting with another form of stress, and one that is uh, a rising problem is viral disease. So bees, as, as we all well know, suffer from a wide variety of different diseases, including numerous different viral diseases. Uh, here are a few examples of some of the more common honeybee viruses and the ones that we worked with for our study. 
In collaboration with uh, Adam Dolzel, who was a former postdoc in my lab, now an assistant professor at University of Illinois, Brian Ibanning, um, and Jimena Carrillo-Trip, who was a former postdoc in the lab, we looked at um, viral infections in honeybees and we were actually able to do experimental infections of bees um, with a viral inoculum that was a mixed inoculum of these four viruses. We actually just fed it to bees and then we could look at how these bees withstood this virus infection and then give them different diets uh, and see whether having a high quality diet or a diverse diet protected them from the effects of these viruses. So I'm gonna to describe to you a, an experiment that we did in the laboratory using cages and it involved these eight different treatments. We had um, bees under different diets, no pollen, sugar only, polyfluoropollen with sugar. This included 10 different um, plant species, and it was bee collected pollen from a diverse landscape. And then we had two different sources of monofloral pollen, uh, one from chestnut, which is considered to be um, nutritionally a good source of pollen, and one from rock rose or cystus, which is considered to be a um, nutritionally deficient source of pollen. And then we were able to challenge bees with this experimental virus infection and then um, compare bees that were either virus inoculated or not inoculated with virus and look at their ability to withstand uh, these viral infections basically by tracking the mortality as well as tracking levels of the virus infection. Now most of this uh, viral induced mortality actually was due to Israeli acute paralysis virus, which is what we had found in some previous studies to be the virus that really took off um, based on this experimental inoculation that we were doing. So we think this viral mortality actually is mostly due to the effects of Israeli acute paralysis virus. So we hypothesized that bees that eat mixed pollen or high quality pollen will show in a sense nutritional resilience against this viral infection. So here what I'm showing you is a graph of um, the mortality of these bees uh, after 72 hours in cages. And we see that when there is no viral um, inoculation present, we saw no differences in mortality in bees fed these different diets, no pollen, polyfloral, and then the two monofloral pollens. However, when we added in the virus infection, we did see that there were significant differences between the diets. We saw that the highest mortality was in the bees that had no pollen in their diet, not surprisingly. And we saw a significantly lower mortality in bees that were fed this, this diverse polyfloral pollen. And then we saw intermediate effects with the different monofloral pollens that actually went along with um, our uh, previous data suggesting that this cystus pollen is good pollen and this castania or chestnut pollen uh, sorry, the, the cystis pollen is bad pollen, and then the castania or, or um, uh, chestnut pollen is, is, is uh, good pollen. And so what's wrong with this cystis pollen? Uh, previous studies had shown that it is low in total protein, certain amino acids, and antioxidants. And then we further tested it because we were interested in looking at micronutrients and found that it was actually deficient as well in calcium and iron. And so it seems like um, the combination of diverse pollen, here in the polyfloral case, and uh, good pollen, in the case of this castania, which was more nutritionally complete, has the potential to rescue bees from virus-induced mortality. So given this, we were interested in if these diverse uh, sources of pollen and nutritional pollens are actually providing benefits to bees. Uh, what if we look on more on a landscape scale? So what's the connection between agricultural land development um, in, in our extreme case in Iowa and honeybee nutritional state? So to do this, uh, we looked at bees from apiaries in these highly cultivated landscapes, but we actually divided them into extremely highly cultivated um, landscapes and um, those that were more lowly cultivated. And we hypothesized that bees uh, from apiaries in highly cultivated landscapes would show nutritional deficits compared to apiaries um, in these more lowly cultivated landscapes. How did we do this? Um, we actually did this by teaming up with beekeepers throughout the state of Iowa. And we called them on the phone and we asked them to mail us uh, a cup full of bees from their beehives throughout the state. So we collaborated with Iowa beekeepers. We got 36 beekeepers to send us live bees through the mail uh, from colonies across the state of Iowa. 
Um, we asked them to collect them at pre overwintering time, which we thought would be useful for understanding um, the nutritional state of bees going into winter, which can be a really important time for um, pre overwintering survival. And we also then process these bees in the laboratory to measure their lipid content. Uh, fat body lipids are um, a good indicator of the uh, nutritional health of bees, especially um, because typically we think about winter bees or uh, bees going into the pre-overwintering state as having higher lipid stores and that these are metabolized during the winter. Going into winter with low lipid stores, um, bees are usually not in good shape and less likely to survive. We then characterized the surrounding landscape of the apiaries um, that these beekeepers had their colonies at using um, geographic information systems. And then we divided these into apiaries in areas of high cultivation and areas of low cultivation, um, getting uh, samples from 110 different beehives. What we found was that um, when we looked at the lipid content, Bees in areas of low cultivation, which in our case is only 17 to 40% corn and soybeans, still pretty high actually, but for us that's low. Um, we saw a lipid content that was somewhat reflective of what we expect to see in pre-overwintering bees. But in areas of high cultivation, we found um, much reduced lipid stores. Interestingly, um, this effect was only significant when we looked at bees that didn't have varroa mite infestations. When bees had varroa mite infestations, all bets were off and everybody had low lipid stores. And so we see, appear to see a nutritional benefit uh, from bees living in these uh, more lowly cultivated landscapes, but again, only in the absence of um, the high levels of varroa infestation. So next we wanted to look a, more across the season and see if we could identify whether there's a critical period for bee nutrition. So we did this um, by monitoring the health of colonies located next to soybean fields in um, 20 different apiary sites over the course of two years, um, monitoring over 80 different hives. And this was in collaboration with Matt O'Neill at Iowa State University, again, um, Adam Dolezal, and two graduate students in um, their code bias by Matt and I, Ashley St. Clair and Gush. So we already knew that bee behavior suggests that there is a time of forage dearth in the fall. It's robbing season. And you can see that the bees are clearly um, looking for food because they're robbing each other out. And we have to take a lot of precautions for this as beekeepers. And so this um, led us logically to the hypothesis that late summer and early fall is a time of nutritional stress for honeybees in these highly cultivated landscapes. And so by tracking colony mass over the season, um, we found indeed that there was, um, the col that colonies grew through about the, the beginning of August, and then they experienced a precipitous decline in colony mass. We saw similar effects with um, bee population as well as the amount of brood in these colonies. But what, we, what surprised us more than seeing the decline was just how precipitous, how fast, and how um, dramatic that decline was. So they lost um, about 53% of their mass um, during this couple of month period, um, losing over 11 kilograms in weight, which is a, a huge amount of colony loss. So some mass decline is typical during this time of year. We all expect our colonies to lose some weight during this time of year, but this loss seemed to us very extreme. And so it, we became concerned about this, this precipitous decline at the end of the season, and we were curious what was going on with foraging resources in the environment. We also looked at declining, uh, we also looked at the nutritional state of honeybees by looking at their um, lipid stores. And we found indeed that the lipid stores of individual bees found in these colonies were actually going down. And here in October, this is this pre-overwintering state, we are hoping for high lipid stores for these pre-overwintering bees instead they are light, they're skinnier with lower lipid content than they have ever been throughout the season. So this does not bode well for their overwintering survival. So we see that both colonies and individual bees show decline in nutrition at the end of the season, and these are likely to be harbingers of winter losses. Um, so what we see, and I'm not showing the data here, but other studies where we looked at mortality suggest that colonies below 10 kilograms basically never survive the winter. 
and almost all of these colonies in this case were. We did not provide any supplemental fee to these colonies on purpose because we wanted to look at what was going on with foraging resources that the environment was providing to the bees. And we did see when we looked at the foraging resources in the environment that the colony decline coincides with the cessation of clover bloom, which is shown here in the black line, and also with the cessation of soybean bloom in um, the percent of fields um, in, of soybeans in bloom here shown in green. And so here's when colonies start declining and that coincides very much with uh, what are likely the two dominant sources of forage in this um, fairly simplified or depauperate environment, clover and soybeans. And so we see that bees are using soybean nectar as forage. Um, they did not appear to be able to use the soybeans for pollen forage. Uh, clover is well known to be a favorite source of pollen and nectar forage for bees. And we see that these are both in steep decline um, by late August when these colonies are losing weight. We can also ask the bees what they're foraging on by using pollen traps that we put on the entrances of the colonies. And we find that the amount of total pollen also declines precipitously um, between August and September. And if we look at the composition of that pollen, um, clover being one of the main sources, declines also greatly at the end of the season. Um, and there is very little else left in the environment at that point in time. And so this suggests to us that this intensively farmed landscape is deficient in foraging resources and is failing to support the nutritional health of these bees at the end of the season. So this is bad news and um, it kind of goes along with uh, the very poor colony health and high levels of annual colony losses that we're seeing in, in Iowa and the upper Midwestern United States. And so what are some possible solutions? What other options might we have um, thinking about the landscape and how it might better support nutritional health of honeybees? So one of the things that we are interested in is looking at some of these few remaining prairies that are found in Iowa. And so we took some honeybee colonies and placed them into restored prairies in Iowa to see if there could be a positive effect of rearing honeybees in prairies. Now we may think that there would be um, more diverse foraging resources, but honeybees are not native to the United States and it wasn't immediately obvious whether they would actually be using these prairie plants for forage. So we put these colonies in native, in native prairie um, and these have higher floral diversity. We also thought that they would be more likely to have flowers present across the, the season rather than just in a limited period of time um, as we showed with, uh, with the clover and soybean bloom. So we hypothesized that prairie habitat could prevent the late season decline of honeybees. And we did this in a way where we took colonies that were previously located in soybeans and we actually moved them to prairies at that critical moment when they um, typically start losing weight. And um, what we did was um, transported colonies to prairies um, right at this time when um, the typically in sort of mid-August when the steep colony decline begins. And this was an experiment done by Ashley St. Clair. And she found that the colonies that were moved to prairie um, showed much greater um, increases in colony mass. And in fact, they kind of rebounded their colony mass to what they had shown earlier in the season. And so this is, uh, I think, a, a striking example of how Yes, there is going to be probably some colony loss, less brood production in honeybee colonies at the end of the season, but this decline is not inevitable. They don't necessarily need to be losing as much weight. Um, we shouldn't expect them to be losing as much weight and declining as much in nutritional state as we had seen in our uh, honeybee colonies that were in soybean fields. And the nutritional state of individual bees also reflected this. So this is looking at the lipid content of individual bees from those colonies again across the season. Here's when they were moved to prairie, and then by the end of the season, um, close to um, pre-overwintering time, the bees that had been moved to prairies had higher lipid content than the bees that had stayed in soybeans. So if you're interested in this, um, there's a talk by Randall Cass, who is a member of our group working on this project. Um, he is actually talking, sorry, not today, it's on Thursday at 1.30, um, and he'll be talking more about this prairie rescue experiment and also some work that we're doing to also look at the impact of insecticides in, um, in soybean fields. 
So what are bees actually collecting in these prairies? And so um, again, we put pollen traps on colonies that were located in prairies and compared those to colonies that were located in cultivated sites. And we found that honeybees actually are using uh, some of these native plants um, as sources of forage, especially partridge pea. And so comparing soybean sites to prairie sites, um, there's way more um, of this partridge pea pollen being collected in prairie sites compared to soybean. They're also using um, goldenrod and sunflower from these prairie sites. And this is uh, happening late in the season uh, when there's almost nothing left in these soybean dominated landscapes. So this is all well and good, and prairies are um, something that we'd like to support prairie restorations. Um, on the other hand, uh, Iowa is um, a huge agricultural um, epicenter, and it's unlikely that much of Iowa is going to be reconverted back into prairie anytime soon. And so we're starting to think uh, of a more practical real world solution in which we might be able to find a sustainable solution that both supports agricultural production as well as helps support the nutritional health of bees in this landscape. So we're teaming up with uh, an excellent group of people um, led by Lisa Schulte-Moore at Iowa State University who have been working on a, um, an initiative which they call Prairie Strips um, for several years now. And basically the idea is in both um, corn and soybean row crops that 10% of the crop field is taken out of production and seeded with prairie plants as shown here. And um, although this does result in um, the use of some of the land for non-crop production, um, there are multiple benefits that are um, realized from um, uh, integrating this practice. And this is a publication that came out a couple of years ago from Lisa and her collaborators, um, showing that it prevents soil erosion, um, also improves uh, soil health, and um, can provide some real long-term benefits um, for sustainable production of these row crops in, in the Midwest. It also is providing great um, benefits for uh, biodiversity, including supporting wild bees as well as other wildlife. And so could we potentially use these prairie strips to help support um, the nutritional health of honeybees? So teaming up with Lisa, as well as Matt O'Neill and other collaborators at Iowa State University who are looking at toxicological and economic aspects of this, as well as Ge Zhang, who really is the, the MVP or most valuable person on this project, who's been doing a lot of work out in the field with one of these prairie strips. We've been looking at how do honeybees do in these prairie strips. So this is an example uh, from, from basically right now. Um, this experiment is ongoing. We've been doing it for a couple years now uh, with multiple different strip sites as well as control sites, and we have some really nice, big, healthy colonies coming out of these prairie strips. So we see that colonies gain more weight at strip sites, as shown in the red line here, and that this seems to last throughout um, much of the, of the season. And we also see, um, by the way, we're now finishing the season, and we're analyzing uh, the, the lipid content of these bees, as well as tracking winter survival of these bees, so the data analyses are ongoing, but thus far uh, they do look quite promising. And then also looking at the pollen that these bees are collecting, we see um, significantly higher amounts of pollen being brought back from colonies in these prairie strips compared to colonies in control sites. So overall this suggests that prairie strips may provide tangible benefits for both farmers and beekeepers and may provide nutritional benefits, especially during these critical periods in, uh, in the season for the honeybee nutritional health. So to summarize what I've told you today, um, nutrition is fundamental. So we've done some experimental work suggesting that good nutrition um, in the form of both diverse pollen or, um, and or pollen with a full complement of um, micronutrients and macronutrients can protect bees from other forms of stress, such as viruses. There have been studies from other groups that show that it can also protect them from um, the ravages of Nosema and uh, Varroa as well. We've shown that a simplified landscape of intensive cultivation um, does not support the nutritional health of honeybees, especially when you take this longitudinal perspective throughout the season. Um, and this is affecting both colonies and the nutritional health of individual bees. We've identified a critical period for nutrition in the end of the season in which they experience a great forage dearth. Um, and this is right when bees should be bulking up for overwintering. And our experiments with prairies suggest that this decline is not inevitable. And so there are things that we can do on the landscape to try to mitigate some of these nutritional declines. 
And so our work on prairie strips is now suggesting that landscapes with more diverse forage may be able to help negate some of these nutritional declines that we're seeing in bees, um, and that more diverse agroecosystems um, involving the reintegration of native habitat into the landscape may provide uh, stacked benefits in terms of multiple ecosystem services for farmers, um, also biodiversity enhancement, and also providing um, benefits for the health of honeybees. And so my final word is that nutrition is fundamental. And so with all the global change that's happening, it's providing many different sources of stress for honeybees, not just nutritional stress. And so in a recent review um, with Adam Dolzel, we're suggesting that if we want to improve bees' health, one of the best ways to do this may be to improve um, bees' nutritional resilience by providing them with habitats, and uh, landscapes and uh, nutritional um, supplements that can best support their nutritional health and help buffer them from other sources of stress such as pathogens and also pesticides in the environment. And so I, I would really like to thank all the people that helped out with this work, um, especially um, Adam Dolzo, who was a collaborator on all of this, um, Matt O'Neill at Iowa State, um, also a uh, important collaborator, and um, these people highlighted here have been really instrumental in collecting most of the data and also the funding sources um, for supporting this work and the millions of bees who were involved in this experience.